Hello all you townies out there. This is Dr. Hefe with the Towns Finale. Yes, this is going to be my last Towns video. I may come back to it once they release some new versions. I'm playing version 8A right now. So once they release some new versions, may come back to it and look at what the new additions to the game are. But this is going to be my final video for a while. And in this video, I'm going to go over the top 10. 10 best and worst things about towns. And it's not just going to be a criticism. I'm also going to give some feedback on what can be improved. Don't know if any of the designers will see this, but who knows. Somehow ideas get filtered through the internet. And at the end of this video, there's going to be a little bit of bonus content, so stay tuned for that. So to start with, let's go over the 10 best things, the things I liked about this game. Starting with number 10, I enjoyed the fact that you can turn enemies into pigs. Yes, the mage can turn them into pigs. I, I enjoy any game that has a polymorph system. Ever since Warcraft 2, when you were turning them into pigs and seals and sheep, that's, that's cool. I enjoy a game that does that. Number nine, actually this goes quite well with the turning enemies into pigs, is the hero abilities, how they all have different skills. It's cool that dwarves can go into enrage mode to increase their attack power. The thieves can stun enemies or confuse them. These are all pretty cool abilities, but I wish that the game had a way of making these abilities more well known to you instead of leaving you guessing for example the barbarian I had no idea why he was just sleeping randomly outside I was wanting to go to his room find him a room and pimp it out give him some awesome stuff to fit his barbarian lifestyle but I didn't know that barbarians just don't take rooms at the end that's, that's strange so a little bit more of a little more information would have been nice Number eight is the patrol point system. I really like how you can set your soldiers to go to certain areas. The only thing that needs to be improved upon is let's expand this to heroes. I'm tired of heroes just sitting around or wandering in different directions. Let me tell them where to go. They are pretty foolish when the computer is controlling them, so let the player take control. Number seven is the sieges. I really liked that first siege. If you are not expecting that siege to come, it could probably wipe out your entire town. But the problem is, is that these sieges don't scale well. After the first siege and you get all your citizens armored, then basically every siege afterwards is going to be easy to take over. And look at all these stupid green slimes that are just laying around my town. Just send something else for Pete's sake. <laughs> number six is the increasing difficulty of monsters and the better items being dropped as you go further down in the dungeons I really enjoyed the pacing of this game how it went from just goblins and spiders to the hobgoblins to ogres to the burning pet except for the final dungeon I think that these dungeons were very well paced So, but we'll go into that final dungeon later Number five is the auto task queue. This thing over here that allows you to set tasks for them to do automatically. That was pretty awesome. It's a great way of kind of allowing you not to have to micromanage every single thing in this game. Although it would be, they just really need to redesign this user interface right here. There's, there's some problems with that. Number four is the trading with merchants. Yes, being able to trade with the caravans with the merchants is pretty cool. In fact, it's almost necessary in certain levels. Wow, look at all these fools just standing around there. But they need to either increase the frequency of the merchants coming or just increase the amount of items you can trade with merchants. Because towards the end of the game, I just had so many items, so much stuff that I wanted to get rid of, and not having merchants around to trade with, that was a real pain in the ass. There's just a bunch of items cluttering up my inventory. So, in fact, if you could just trade items at any time, 
for a completely reduced price, I would want to get rid of some of those items at 75 to 90 percent. Maybe even get rid of, get rid of them for one gold piece each. That would be cool. So I enjoy the fact that you can trade, but definitely need to make that more often. And number three, well, getting down here, the animal farms. <laughs> Look at all these scooter beauties. They're everywhere in here. That's pretty cool. Although if you do not fence them in, they do have a tendency to overrun your town completely. But I enjoy these animal farms. They're, they're pretty necessary and a pretty cool thing to keep your town well fed. Number two is the variety. There is so much variety in this game. It's pretty awesome. From all the decorations that you can do. Look at all these things you can choose. But the thing that really blows me away is all these different walls. There's so much variety of walls that you can build. Of course, some of them require extra items rather than just stone. You, you need some red gels to build these red colored blocks. But there is a lot of variety here, and that's pretty cool. It is a little bit overwhelming, like knowing how the progression order is, going from carpenter's bench to stonemason to smelter, and getting all that set up is a little bit confusing, but I enjoy that variety. That is really, really cool. And the number one best thing about this game needs no improvements maybe just a little bit more often, is bears shooting fireballs. That is so cool. Just give them that helm of the beast. Where are my soldiers? Yeah, there they are. Mask of the beast and a golden staff. And you have a bear shooting a fireball. That's sick. That's awesome. Now, over to the 10 worst things. There's, there's a lot of things that need improvement, but let's just focus on these 10. So... Number 10, the lack of gold and silver. Yes, once you go really deep down, I can understand it not being available until you get very deep down. But still, there is almost no gold and silver available throughout this entire dungeon. Like I'm trying to find where it was before. <laughs> where I found it before, where, where was that gold? Over here? See, I can't even find it. That's how scarce it is. Here's some gravel. Yes, there needs... So here's just a minuscule amount of silver. At least once I get down to negative 16 and negative 18, just give me a ton of gold and silver. I've, I've completed the final dungeon. There's no way I'm going to become too overpowered with gold weapons and armor. I just need that gold if I want to build stuff such as the... Not stone walls. Such as the gold walls. How am I supposed to build my golden city without any gold? So, just need to add a little bit more of that. Number nine is that these walls and roofs lack functional value. Yeah, having roof structures looks cool. It looks a lot better than this open structure out here. But there's no real point to it. Citizens can still use these rooms. In fact, you'll get new citizens. I just created a little underground slum down here of just beds everywhere. It Having walls and roofs doesn't seem functional, so... Give it more than just aesthetic value. Number eight is that certain maps restrict what you can build. Yes, in this jungle map, I can't plant any flowers. You can't plant flowers on jungle soil. Without flowers, I can't make dyes easily. So getting this purple roof was actually pretty difficult. And also there's no beasts in this level so getting bones there's a lack of bone to build bone armor bone weapons I understand that you want to make certain maps very distinct and individual but restricting what the player can build kind of kind of is a bummer especially since I'm pretty sure that each person is not going to have enough time to create a fully sprawling town in each of the different maps so number seven I believe the lack of citizen individuality. Yes, these citizens may look different, but throughout the game I had no idea what any of their differences were. They have different eat numbers, different sleep numbers, but they're all so close that it doesn't really matter. Their names don't matter. I don't know if they have any individual preferences, whether anything makes them happy, whether they like a certain type of food. I don't know any of that. These. These citizens are just basically 
the same. So at least give us an ability to either customize their names or learn a little bit more about them. That way, maybe I'd feel a little bit more attached to them and not care when they get slaughtered so randomly. Number six is the food and sleep requirements for heroes. So yeah, piggybacking on that food and sleep requirement. These heroes have such low food, well they don't show it to you, but it always seems as if they're going to go, have to go back and get food or have to go back and get sleep. That's annoying, especially when you want to clear a dungeon. Either allow them, increase the amount of time that they can go in between eating and sleeping, or actually just do that. That would be great. There's, there's no other option. Number five, you're unable to stop citizens once they are given an order. You do not know how many times I had citizens starve to death while trying to auto-equip themselves. They would just run into the dungeons looking for items or run around trying to get ghoul heads to put on pikes to decorate my city. And they were obviously starving. They were obviously sleep deprived. They were moving super slow. I just want to tell them, hey, go to sleep. There's, you're not going to be able to get out of this dungeon in time. But no, they are single-minded. So at least a stop order, something to stop them and allow them to reassess, oh, I need to go to sleep, would be very much appreciated. Number four is the inability to change perspective. Yes, this is actually a very big one. Being able to only look at your town from one angle is more simple in a programming perspective but it's kind of annoying from a player's perspective like look there's a house back here but I can't see it because there's trees in the way I have to go all the way down here and get rid of the tree layer so that I can actually see where my carpentry building is just let me change perspective I like to look at my town from a new angle and going into this is the inability to turn objects I know that these objects can be turned I've seen stairs they can see these stairs look good they actually line up going up to the walls these stairs don't make any sense <laughs> so allow us to turn these objects doors turn they face the right way roofs make a good roof pattern so just allow us to turn the other items in the world why do all these beds have to look the same they're all facing the same way just let me turn these beds come on <laughs> number three no, number two. Wow, we're already there. Number two is the final dungeon. Yes, if you guys saw that dungeon, f the last video, the final dungeon, you guys know. That was a big letdown, a big anticlimax. Something more than sneaky ghouls. Come on, let's work on that. And the number one biggest complaint, worst thing about the game, is the game speed. The pacing of the game is good. I think the dungeon difficulty and upgrades that's good but how it moves at such an agonizingly slow speed is terrible when you're first building your town your citizens take forever especially when you only have 15 guys it take forever to plant stuff chop stuff down build things oh my goodness so much have I just been clicking the increased speed and I just check up here nope game speed is still three allow me to speed these guys up some more the first I'd say the first five hours is fun you get to you're becoming familiarized with the game exploring finding new things then there's that middle part of the game where you're trying to build up your city oh my goodness <laughs> that was just terrible terrible I just played this game alt tabbed I'd sent them some orders alt tab it come back 20 minutes later see how they've been doing do the same thing that's that's not how a game should be played I hope that the designers do not want their game to be played that way that's that's not cool so allow us to speed it up a little bit more so yeah that's the top 10 best and worst things feel free to either comment and say that I was wrong on one of these ideas maybe something else that was good that I missed or something awful that I missed let me know let me know your opinions on that so, that has been the top 10, and now for the bonus footage. Here we go. It's another fine day in the town of Badassville. Here we see citizens 
Cooking, scooty booty for feasting. Let's go up, and here we can see into the tavern. Heroes, resting and feasting after a long day of slaying monsters. Even further up we can see the town. What a nice land that it is. Let's just keep going up further and further. And, wait, what is this down here? A skull? What is this? Could it be? Yes, it is the legendary Bone Temple. Surrounded on the top by ghoul poles, the skull symbolizes the death and destruction that has surrounded this town since its founding. A 28 by 28 square, this bone temple sits upon 10 stories stacked of bones of enemies who have been slaughtered. Within the bone temple, we can see multiple stories, storage areas for the skulls of slain enemies. This temple is home to 71 goblin heads, 232 hobgoblin heads, 121 snicker heads, 90 troll heads, and an amazing 128 ghoul heads top the roof. Those guarding it are known as the Bone Guardians. Equipped completely in armor of bone, they stand here to make sure that these trophies, these memorabilia, this gigantic statue and sculpture remains undisturbed by the monsters who still continue to attack this town, even after an entire year has been spent clearing the dungeons of these foul beasts. Yes, this has been quite a good look into the Bone Cult and the Bone Temple. Until next time, remember, take care of yourself.